I have an announcement to make, everybody. I have an announcement. Shortly before the stroke of midnight on Friday the 8th of March, my teeny tiny channel reached a magnificent milestone. Hi everyone, my name's Jake. Welcome to The Kitchen Scrap, where I'm currently challenging myself to learn to survive on British World War II rations for an entire year. I forbid it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so very much. The Kitchen Scrap recently reached a huge milestone, which I thought would take well over a year to achieve. I am absolutely gobsmacked. I feel so overwhelmingly blessed that over 1,000 gorgeous, unique, supportive, loving souls have tuned in to watch this crazy experiment that I'm undertaking this year. Far exceeded my expectations for sure. Cannot say it enough. Thank you so much for all of the support, everybody. It has meant the world to me. These past couple of months on YouTube have been such a crazy roller coaster ride. I'm having a great time and I hope you are too. So when it comes to this rationing experiment, I was actually going to do it regardless of whether or not it was on YouTube. But basically what happened was the more that I started opening up to people about my plans for this year, the more I realized there was definitely a keen fascination with it. Not just in regards to the history behind it all, but there was a sense of longing for good old fashioned back to basics cooking, which is kind of what this channel's all about. So I'm absolutely thrilled that it has been embraced so lovingly. <laughs> Thank you a thousand times over. Love you all. So for today's video, I thought we should celebrate and cook a three course wartime feast. Are you with me? Say yes. Say yes. 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 Now, like last week, I will be providing a cost breakdown of each meal and serving. I'm kind of excited to see what the grand total of this one comes to. I have a feeling we're gonna blow the weekly rations on this cooker, but it's a celebration and I'm going to be making enough to get me through the week. I'm actually gonna be filming this over two nights because there is some prep that I need to get done for tomorrow night. We're actually going to start with the dessert. Now, this is a little experiment that I am trying out. It's not an official recipe, so I've had an idea and I'm not sure if this is gonna work. So for anyone that saw the Lord Wilton Pie recipe video, at the end, I made Chris's mother's dessert, which was a pastry disc layered with apples, baked in the oven, and then covered in custard that was made with water, not milk. And in the video, I said it kind of reminded me of a lemon curd. So I thought we could try and make a mock lemon curd tart. We're actually gonna use the same wholemeal pastry recipe that we used in that video, which came from Marguerite Patton's Feeding the Nation. So for the recipe, you will need eight ounces of plain wheat meal flour, half a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of baking powder, and two ounces of margarine or butter. Now I get two ounces of butter each week in the ration and we're going to use the whole lot of it in this pastry because it's a celebration, but it has to be said, real butter in pastry. Mm. So let the cooking begin. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Now I've already measured out eight ounces of wholemeal flour and I added a teaspoon of baking powder. Didn't worry about the salt because the butter is actually salted. So that's just 50 grams in there. And I'm just going to mix this together and break up the butter and just gradually incorporate that butter into the flour until it resembles breadcrumbs. Remember to lift as you go to aerate it. Now I'm just going to slowly and gradually add some cold water. Chilled cold water is the best for pastry. So just little by little, might start off with a spoon for this, maybe a fork, because all my spoons are in the dishwasher. All right, that's come together nicely. So traditionally when you are making pastry, at this point you're supposed to cover it in cling wrap and put it in the fridge for an hour or two to help it rest before we roll it out. We're just gonna skip that step though and go straight to rolling it out. Oh my God, I get to use my new rolling pin for the first time. How exciting. Ah, oh, this is so much easier. It takes half the time. So I'm just gonna go around and gently press it down or into the edges. Now I'm just gonna go back around and trim the top off. We've actually ended up with quite a bit extra. So I'm gonna wrap this up and put it in the fridge. I think I might make like one veggie turnover with it. We'll see. So now we wanna bake this and I'm gonna blind bake it. So I've just got some old baking paper, which I've already used. You can keep reusing this as long as it's not filthy and covered in oil and bits and whatnot. Just don't put the dirty side down, of course. 
course. And I'm gonna chuck in some baking beads. Now if you don't have baking beads, you can use uncooked rice or lentils for this. Just don't consume them afterwards and you can keep reusing them. All right, so I have my oven preheating at 200 and I'm just going to whack this in for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. I'll check on it at the 20 minute mark. Okay, so I may have momentarily gotten distracted replying to a Facebook message and let this cook for five minutes longer. I think it looks much worse on camera than it does in real life. I wouldn't say it's burnt around the top. I mean, it's kind of getting close on this section here. It's just really well done. It'll be fine. There we go. It's not too bad. It's a little rustic, but that's home cooking. So it's time to make the filling. Now I do apologize because I can't remember who it was, but someone did ask me if I could make custard on camera. It honestly couldn't be easier. We're just going to be using bird's eye instant custard powder, which wasn't on the Russian. And from memory, I don't think you needed points to use this. Now I am going to have to make quite a lot. I'm going to have to remember the measurements because we need to do a cost breakdown. So one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now I am just going to add some water to help get that going. Turn the heat on and just start whisking vigorously. Get rid of all the lumps. Just got the heat on medium, you don't want it too high, and you just want to keep on whisking it constantly. I'm going to add some more water. Don't want it to be too runny though, I really want a thick custard that will set in the fridge. As for sugar, I'm just gonna do it to taste. So one, two, three, four. Let's start with four tablespoons, see how we go. Just give that a little taste test. Okay, four tablespoons was the magic number. It's not too sweet. Next, we're gonna add some lemon extract. I've never used this before. It does smell quite lemony, but it's not super strong. So I feel like I'm just gonna go for gold with this. Oh, what's it doing? It's sitting on the top like an oil. Oh, this is thickening up quick. That got thick really fast. Whisk, Jake, whisk. I mean, it really does just look like lemon curd when you make the custard with water. Should I add more water? Okay, adding more water was definitely the right thing to do. I might add a bit more lemon extract. It's down to there now. So I would say a good tablespoon worth of lemon extract. It smells phenomenal. All right, we have to taste this. So you definitely get a lemon kick from this, but it's more like a candied lemon flavor. So if you used actual lemon juice and like the zest of a lemon, this would be absolutely phenomenal. But for what it is, as a mock lemon curd, I'm impressed. Look at that. All right, we are going to pour this into our tart shell. If you had some egg whites, you could totally make a meringue. Maybe that's what I should do. I don't have any eggs. Was lemon meringue pie a thing back in the 40s? I don't know. I just realized something. I have to eat this whole thing. So there we have it, mock lemon curd tart. I'm just gonna let this cool down for a while and then I'm gonna whack it in the fridge and let it set overnight. All right, it's the next day and I cannot stop thinking about lemon meringue pie. Once I got the idea in my head, that was it. Now to the best of my knowledge, I don't think lemon meringue pie was a thing back in 1940s Britain. I'm not entirely sure. So I haven't been able to find a recipe for lemon meringue pie or mock lemon meringue pie in any of my wartime cookbooks, but I consulted one of my favorites, which is Radiation Cookery Book. Now, I believe this was first published in 1927. This is an original copy from 1931. It's 93 years old. It used to belong to an E. Taylor, it's old and tattered, the pages are stained, it's kind of falling apart. There's some handwritten notes here, I don't know if you can see that. This is on the marmalade page. I just love that kind of thing, it makes it more personal. Anyways, couldn't find a recipe for lemon meringue pie in this book either. However, there are plenty of lemon desserts. We've got a recipe for a lemon mold, a lemon pudding, lemon cheesecakes, lemon sandwiches, lemon curd roll, lemon jelly, lemon sauce, and lemon souffle. Now, if I look at the recipe for lemon pudding, directly underneath it, there is a recipe for meringue pudding. Well, it actually directs you to another page. What I love about this cookbook, it sets out entire menus for you to work through. It's really great. I've tested quite a few recipes from this cookbook and they've mostly all been gorgeous. So I may be exploiting my liberties here by creating a mock lemon meringue pie, but in the spirit of wartime invention and using what we have, we're gonna go for it. But here's the other thing. 
I don't have any eggs. In fact, I haven't purchased any eggs since the end of December last year. I think I used a total of three eggs in January. I'm technically entitled to one per week living on the ration, but I just don't really eat a lot of eggs. Basically, the only time I use them is if I'm baking. And the thing about these wartime recipes is that they try to avoid using eggs. So we're going to use this. We're not gonna use the actual beans. We're going to use the aquafaba or the beanie liquid goodness that's inside this can to make a meringue. And of course, we're gonna be using the beans as well for another recipe a bit later on. Now I have done this once before and it totally works, but I've never done it with the liquid from cannellini beans. The last time I did it, I used the aquafaba from chickpeas. Now I was gifted this little package of four teeny tiny cans of chickpeas and I do want to eventually use them. However, I simply couldn't find any evidence that chickpeas were available in 1940s Britain. Now this is why I love the Facebook group. So last night I put out a call to action. I said, hey, I need some help. I'm filming a video. I need to know about chickpeas. Does anyone know if they were available at the time? And within a minute, people started replying on it and started researching. <laughs> it was brilliant. So thank you so much, Lisa, Ellen, Holly, and Danielle, and all the others that ended up contributing to my quest. I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. As it turns out, we don't think they were. But Lisa was actually able to find a reference to chickpeas coming from Greece, where apparently they used to roast them to use as a coffee substitute. So there you go. You could get dried tinned beans in brine for about two points in 1942 and 1943. Call it cheating, but I'm just going to say that's what this is and call it a day. So let's give this a go and see if it actually works. Okay, so we're just going to drain the beans. I'm hoping one tin will be enough. Apparently the aquafaba should be able to increase its volume by about five times, but it will take a lot longer to whip up than egg whites. We've ended up with a decent amount. The reason it's probably best to use the aquafaba from either chickpeas or some kind of white bean is because it does have more of a neutral taste, apparently. Now the other ingredients you're going to need for this mock meringue is sugar, of course, some kind of stabilizer, like some cream of tartar, a little bit of vinegar or lemon juice, and definitely some kind of flavoring like vanilla extract. All right. I'm excited to try this. So I'm just gonna add in about half a teaspoon of cream of tartar, some vanilla essence, measured with your heart, of course. Now I am gonna be using an electric hand mixer for this because if anyone has ever attempted to hand whisk egg whites into a meringue, they will know that your arms will nearly fall off. Also, this is the 90s. Right, it's not, you're, you're in the wrong decade. You are. I've been going for about two minutes. It's starting to froth up, but just like a regular meringue, I also need to gradually start adding in some sugar. It's been about six minutes now. It's getting there. All right, coming on 10 minutes now and we have soft peaks. It's working. It's so soft and velvety. I think I added about four and a half tablespoons of sugar to this. Now this is actually safe to eat because it's plant-based. That is so good. It tastes just like the real thing. Now I could just whack this on top of the lemon tart as is. However, I don't want to bake the pie anymore. I'm not sure how the custard would fare. And I think we took the crust to the extreme last night. I do want to bake it like a proper meringue. So I just traced the base of the dish and I'm just going to pipe slightly inside to make sure it fits into the pie. Let's give this a go. I suck at piping at the best of times. So I'm not aiming for anything fancy. It's a little bit higgledy piggledy. It is a bit softer, so I'm wondering if it's gonna hold its shape at all. Probably won't, but do we dare do a second layer? Let's start from the middle this time. But we want the drama of the meringue. You see, I don't think you should have said that. It's just like this big globby mess. I'm going to whack this straight into the oven. It's about 160 fan forced. I'll check on it in 15 minutes and we'll see how we go from there. Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. You guys, what the f Okay, <laughs> look what happened. This was the biggest disaster I have had in the kitchen for a long time. First of all, what the bloody hell was I thinking? Putting it on a tray with holes underneath. I very naively thought that 
the meringue would hold its shape and it would be safe sitting on the parchment paper. First of all, it expanded and then it all just melted and dripped all through my oven. Also, I think my oven might have been too hot. I will not be defeated though. I'm going to give this a second go because we do have another can of cannellini beans and I am determined to make this work. Round de. Okay, I feel like that second batch took a lot longer to whip for some reason. This time I added a smaller amount of vanilla essence and I did it towards the end. Same amount of sugar, same amount of cream of tartar. So I'm just gonna whack this into a piping bag. This time I'm going to put it into a dish that has a little bit more protection, mainly for my oven's sake. Thank God I didn't actually put this directly onto the pie itself. I still don't know if this is going to work. I think another issue was that the fan was on in my oven and I vaguely recall reading that that's bad for meringues. So <sighs> take two, hopefully this works. To be honest, I am losing a bit of hope. I'm guessing it's just going to spread, so I'll just start out in the middle this time. Don't even know why I'm bothering to pipe this, to be honest. Think happy thoughts, Jake. Think positively. Even if it just cooks properly and doesn't melt, I can do like meringue shards on top. That will still be really nice. Pray with me, guys. Let's hope this one works. The mess in my oven. Oh! <laughs> I am dreading cleaning that. Ugh. FML. What can you do? These things happen. It's all an experiment in the kitchen. Meanwhile, this is delicious. And you really can just eat it as is. It happened again. <laughs> okay, this is starting to p me off because I have successfully made meringue before out of aquafaba. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Is it because it's coming from cannellini beans? And now it's become a personal vendetta because I have spent so much time on this already. Do I try the aquafaba from the chickpeas and just like freeze the chickpeas for later use or give them to someone? I don't know what to do. Well, it looks like crap, but it's actually really delicious. Even though it's as flat as a pancake, it does actually have the texture of a meringue in certain parts. What happened here on the sides was that the baking paper ended up folding over. For like the first 20 minutes in the oven, it was looking great. I thought, awesome, it's working. And then the next time I checked on it, it looked like this. feel like I'm crossing the threshold into madness. Just to give you an idea of the state of my mind right now, I just filled the kettle and instead of putting it on to boil, I took it to my freezer and went to put the kettle inside. And I have no idea why. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. One way or another, I am now hellbent on making this meringue work. Because if I don't, I will go insane and I will take you with me. We are going to try the aquafaba from the chickpeas. Third time's a charm, right? Let's do this. Okay, so I've drained the chickpeas. I put in just a quarter of a teaspoon of cream of tartar. I've read so many online recipes. I've watched YouTube videos. I'm just praying that the issue was that the liquid came from cannellini beans instead of chickpeas. Okay, this is a good sign. In less than a minute, look how much it frothed up compared to last time. So I'm gonna need a bigger bowl. Okay, I have a good feeling about this. It's only been about four minutes and it's frothing up quite nicely. So I'm just gonna start adding my sugar. <laughs> Meanwhile, I pretty much burnt through an entire week's worth of sugar rations, but it's fine because regardless of whether or not this works, we've still got that gorgeous mock lemon tart for the week. I have a good feeling about this. So I'm just gonna add in the vanilla. So maybe half a capful, not too much. That only took about eight minutes. And apparently the way you can tell when meringue is ready is if you can pick it up on a spoon, tip it upside down, and it doesn't fall out. We're there! I've also changed my mind as to how I'm going to present this because I was looking in my fridge and realized there's some other things that I have to use up, and this is a golden opportunity. So instead of doing one big disc of meringue, I'm gonna pipe out small individual ones. Look how full this is. This came from four tiny little cans of chickpeas. This is insane. All right, I need another tray. Any professional bakers out there, don't come at me for my piping skills, please. <laughs> I've still got so much left. So while I was researching, I found out that you could use this stuff for chocolate mousse and mayonnaise. It's essentially just an egg replacer. Now this time I'm working it in the oven at 100 degrees and apparently this is going to take an hour, maybe a little bit more to cook, but I'm gonna be watching these like a hawk. Wish me luck. You guys, it worked. 
They've just come out of the oven. Well, this tray has, the other one's just finishing off now. They are slightly colored on top. It's ended up taking about an hour and 20 minutes at 100 degrees Celsius. I just tried one, they're delicious, but I should have done it on camera, right? I'll just try another one. Eeny, meeny, money. All right, let's go this one. Oh no! <laughs> Damn it. Oh my God, these are so good. But before I get stuck into these, we can finally decorate the mock lemon tart, which is now going to be mock lemon meringue. Yes! Now the custard did kind of crack a little bit in the fridge overnight, but it's totally fine because we're going to be covering it up anyway and it's not going to affect the flavor at all. There we go, it's finally finished. Oh my God. You probably can't see it, but that's supposed to be a one and a K. So I had some leftover raspberries in the fridge and I thought what better time to use them than now. I'm thrilled with how this turned out, but the proof will be in the tasting of it. Now I imagine I'm gonna make a dog's breakfast of this when I actually cut into it. We'll worry about that later. But I just wanna say once again, thank you so much everyone for joining me on this crazy journey this year. All of your love and support is very much felt and appreciated. Thank you so much. That actually didn't slice up too badly. It looks nice and neat. In every sense of the word, this is a mock lemon meringue pie. We've used a wholemeal wartime pastry, a simple instant custard powder, which was available during the war, flavored with some lemon essence, which was available during the war. So the only thing that wasn't wartime was the aquafaba from the chickpeas. But this was created all in the spirit of wartime invention. All right, let's try this baby. Want a bit of everything. Huh. Ugh, no, I'm just kidding. That is delightful. I need to eat more. Only thing that I would say is wrong with this from my privileged ivory tower. Don't get me wrong, this is delicious. It is kind of artificial. It tastes more like candied lemon peel. But if you used actual lemon juice and lemon zest in the custard, Oh my God. This is such a treat anytime, let alone while I'm living on rations, you know? I think we all learned a very valuable lesson today, don't you? So yes, it's possible to make meringues out of chickpea aquafaba. Don't try the cannellini beans. <laughs> the meringue stuck in my mouth. Oh my God. It's just so good. As for the leftover meringue mixture that I had, you can totally use that as a vegan substitute for whipped cream. It would be delicious for almost any dessert. So apparently it will keep in your fridge for up to five days in a sealed container. But I also read online that you can freeze it for up to four months. So that's what I've opted to do because I can't make any more sweets. I've got that entire mock lemon meringue pie to get through and there's leftover meringues as well. Mission accomplished, I'm thrilled. If anyone wants me, I'll be in my room. Okay, so for the actual main meat component of my dinner this evening, we're actually gonna be trying a recipe that Carolyn made on her YouTube channel. I saw her make them a couple of weeks ago and I really want to try them. So we're gonna give it a crack. Now I am going to alter the recipe just a little bit. I'll link her original video down below. So definitely go check that out. So the recipe calls for three ounces of mince. I'm just using TVP, which I cooked in a little faux beef stock with some salt and pepper. With this stuff, I never know how much to measure. Because it's dry to begin with, I used just over half a cup, which actually gave me four ounces, but you know, I'm not gonna keep one ounce aside. We're just gonna chuck it all in. We'll need four ounces of mashed potato. That's just plain, there's literally nothing else in it. Four ounces of breadcrumbs. Now I did actually save half of a homemade wholemeal loaf specifically for these recipes this evening. However, because I haven't really been eating that much bread lately, I left it for a few days. And when I went to check on it today, unfortunately it had turned. I was too late. You're too late. So I didn't have time to make any more bread, but thankfully I actually found half of a dark rye loaf tucked away at the back of my freezer, which I think I bought last November. So I just whacked the rest of it in a food processor and then I toasted it to make it a little bit more crunchy. So we're just gonna chuck those in. And then last but not least, we have some of the cannellini beans that we used before. Now I'm just gonna give these a bit of a mash up. Now this isn't actually part of the recipe, but I thought this is a good opportunity to use it. Now this is only one can's worth. I chucked the content of the other can into a container and whacked it in the freezer. Just gonna give these a bit of a mash. It actually already smells pretty good, which is great considering there's next to no seasoning in this yet. You know what, I'm gonna do what Carolyn did and just get in with my hands for this one. These would make really good hamburger patties. All right now I'm just gonna season this really well with some salt, pepper, a bit of cayenne, now Carolyn used powdered sage in hers, but I'm going to try this with some oregano or oregano to you. I got it from a wise old herb merchant on one of my many travels. So I'm just gonna chuck decent helping in there. 
and just get back in with my hand. Food is feeling, damn, this smells really good. I'm excited. I'm just going to lightly flour my surface, roll this out and cut it into slices. Oh my God, I get to use my adult rolling pin again. Oh, what did she say? Make it into like an oblong shape and then roll it out to, I think it was a quarter of an inch thick. The addition of the beans really helped to extend that out. I'm really excited to try this. I think it's gonna be delicious. Just going to cut this gently and I think I'll do it like this. So I've just got these on medium heat. Uh, Carolyn said about five minutes each side. I'm just gonna finish these off and then I'm going to make a veggie side. So I've just worked on some purple cabbage to cook and I'm going to steam some broccoli as well. Do you guys always use the stalks of your broccoli? Because I always do. So I just trim off the end parts that are a little bit manky. There we go. We had to spill something at least once today. Trim off the sides because the center is soft and beautiful. Now the rest of this can either go in your stock bag or the compost, or if you've got pigs or chickens or something, feed it to them. So next, we're going to make a little side dish called surprise potato balls. I guess my only concern with this one is that the surprise will be that they taste bloody disgusting. The recipe comes from my favorite. Food back for the kitchen front. For this recipe, you will need one pound of cooked potato, one large carrot grated, a teaspoon of chopped parsley, a little sweet pickle, salt and pepper, a few teaspoons of milk if necessary, and some browned breadcrumbs. So, let's get to it. Okay, so I've already cooked and mashed a pound of potato. So I'm just gonna add the carrot and the parsley. Called for one large carrot, I just used two medium. It only called for a teaspoon of chopped parsley, but when it comes to herbs and spices, I say, go big or go home. Mixed together. You know what? This is a job for the old phalanges. The probs should have used a little less carrot, but let's give this a test. Ah, it's fine. Just gonna season this really well with lots of salt and pepper. So I didn't need to add the milk, it was moist enough. Next we're just going to form them into balls and then put them in a tray lined with baking paper. Next we want to poke a hole in each one. Now we want to fill the holes with some sweet mustard pickle. Now I am very blessed because check this out. The last time that mum and dad came to visit me, mum made me a massive jar, two big jars actually, of sweet mustard pickle. And is there anything better than homemade mustard pickles? I think not. So I've already decanted some from the previous jars. So I'm just going to try my best to get the pickle in there. You don't need much. All right, so now we need to go around and actually close the holes. Oh God, I think I've got too much pickle. This could be a messy job, just be aware. I've definitely overfilled the holes, but it's gonna be fine. At this stage, it's kind of getting coated in the pickle. So I think that's going to help the breadcrumbs stick to it as well, so. Now we're just going to roll them in the breadcrumbs. These are the breadcrumbs from that dark rye loaf that I had in the freezer. And they're nice and crunchy. All right, so they've all been crumbed. We've got one more step before we can chuck them into the oven. So the recipe actually says to do something I've never come across before. So once they're in the tray on the baking paper, it says to cover with margarine paper. So I've just cut out another piece of baking paper and I'm just using the last remnants of this Nutalex, which I've kept in the fridge specifically for these greasing occasions. So I'm just going to cover the paper. I think this step is to help it crisp up nicely without burning. Maybe, I don't know. Does anyone know why we do this? So let's put that over the top. And it says to whack it in a really hot oven for 15 to 20 minutes. So I've got mine on about 200. Dinner is served, my friends. So we've got the mince slices from Carolyn's website and YouTube channel. We've got the surprise potato balls. And I just did a side of cabbage with some salt and pepper and some broccoli. And of course, we cannot forget the gravy. I'm gonna hold off putting gravy on these for the time being because I want to taste them first. So let's give them a try. All right, let's try Carolyn's mince slice first. Oh yeah, that's fabulous. Carolyn, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that recipe. I seasoned it really well and I don't think it even needs gravy or sauce. Tomato sauce. 
That would be very naughty, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'd be very naughty. It's forbidden. <laughs> that'd be very, very, very naughty. <laughs> We're gonna do it. As I said, it doesn't need it, but it is gonna take it to the next level. I'm so excited for this. Oh, we'll definitely make that again. Let's try the surprise potato balls. They are quite soft. The outside is a little bit crunchy. I wanna make sure I get some pickle. They're quite nice. They remind me of something though. I can't put my finger on it. It's well-rounded. I like that. It's gonna annoy me because it does remind me of something I've had before, but I can't remember what it is. Quite delicious though. Anyways, I'm gonna go dig into this while it's still hot. Back in a moment. So last but certainly not least, we're going to make our soup starter. We've kind of made everything in reverse today. It's just how I roll. Now this is a very humble but delicious soup that once again comes from Marguerite Gatton's Feeding the Nation. Now it's a carrot and oatmeal soup, which I do believe back in the day was called Skinny. So for this recipe, you will need one ounce of margarine, two medium onions. In preparation for this recipe, I got to buy my first onion in 2024 because the recipe calls for it. I just bought one big one instead of two medium ones. Two tablespoons of medium oatmeal, one pint of cold water. Now we're going to be using some homemade vegetable stock, salt and pepper, half a pint of milk and three medium carrots grated. Now, as always, I'm just going to be using this recipe as a guide because I do have some other ingredients that I would like to incorporate. I have made this soup on numerous occasions in the past year and I really enjoy it. So let's get to it. So I've got all my ingredients here ready for prepping. Look at this beautiful onion. I'm so excited to use this. I've also got this watercress, which isn't part of the recipe, but I need to use it up. And what better time to use it than when making soup? I think it'll help to give it a nice subtle peppery flavor. This is February's oatmeal that I never got through. So I am going to add more oatmeal than required. And just some general seasonings as well. And we're going to be using some homemade veggie stock that I made the other day. So I'm just gonna get these veggies prepped and get cooking. It feels like such a privilege to cook with real onion for a change instead of spring onion. So I've really been taking my time with them. I've just browned them up in an ounce of margarine, help develop that nice bold flavor. Now the recipe says at this stage to add the stock and then adding the carrots towards the end, but I'm just going to add them now. Cook them up for a minute or two, and then I'm going to add the stock. All right, now we're gonna add our homemade veggie stock. Season well with some salt and pepper. I'm just gonna add a little bit more water to this to extend it. Oh, it's finally raining, lovely. I've been looking forward to this. It feels like it hasn't rained in Melbourne for like a month. It probably has, but I haven't seen it for weeks now. I'm just gonna bring this to the boil before we add the rest of the ingredients. So I just double checked the cooking time for this and it seems quite extraordinary for what it is. So it says to simmer steadily for 30 minutes, stirring frequently, then add the milk and the carrots and cook for a further 15 minutes. 45 minutes for a soup as simple as this. That seems a little extreme to me. We're going to cut that time down by half. Now I'm just gonna add the watercress, stems and all. As for the oatmeal, it only calls for two tablespoons, but I've made this a number of times in the past and I've always bulked up the oatmeal element and I really enjoy it. So I'm just going to eyeball this. Probably added a quarter of a cup. It stirs all together. Last but not least, it calls for half a pint of milk. Now, because we have much more soup than the recipe actually called for, I've just done a full pint. And of course I have used my trusty milk powder. So I'm just gonna pour that in. I've just tested for seasoning and it definitely needed some more salt and pepper. All right, the seasoning is on point, but you know what? I just can't help myself. I'm going to add some cayenne pepper to this as well. I just love that cayenne kick, you know? Another taste test. <coughs> Mama got a bit trigger happy with the cayenne pepper there. <laughs> it's definitely got a kick to it. That's fine though, I quite enjoy it. Food should always invigorate all of the senses, right? I'm just going to bring this up to a gentle simmer and then it's pretty much done. All right, the soup is done. Now it's not lost to me that for some people, they might think that this looks like their kitchen sink after a couple of rounds of dishes, but I promise you, this is absolutely delicious and it's super economical. See what I did there? Now I'm going to enjoy a lovely bowl of this while it's still hot. I've been thinking about these chickpeas. I initially put them in my freezer where it's likely they would sit 
for the rest of the year. But then I started thinking about the article that Lisa found, which said that, you know, while Greece was occupied by Germany during the Second World War, they used to use roasted chickpeas as a coffee alternative. So given there's kind of a theme of wartime invention today, I thought we should give it a go. What do you reckon? I don't think so. So while I was debating whether or not I should do this, I suddenly recalled I've seen this done recently on a YouTube channel that I follow. So another little shout out here. His name is Paul. His channel is called I Cook. I paint and he posts lots of wonderful, weird, wacky, frugal recipes. They're so much fun to watch. I highly recommend that you go check out his channel. And he posted a short semi recently of him making mock coffee out of roasted chickpeas. So I'm just gonna follow along to that. So let's get cheeky with it. Okay, so I've got the chickpeas here. It works out to be just slightly over a pound. I am just going to dry them off a little bit before I whack them in the pan. So spread them out on an even layer, fold that over, and just give them a gentle rub. I don't even know if this is necessary, but we're doing it. You can actually see how much liquid was absorbed there. And then we're just going to put them in the pan. Now I'm just gonna roast these for about 30, 40 minutes at 200 degrees fan forced. I'll check them halfway and give them a toss as well. So the chickpeas are done. I ended up roasting them in the oven for about 40 minutes and I tossed them halfway through. Now these are pretty hard and we need to grind them down into a fine powder. I used a coffee grinder. I'm just going to use like a mini food processor. Apologies to my neighbors in advance because this shiz is gonna get loud. Now I could probably get this a little finer, but to be honest, this was so freaking loud. I don't want to upset my neighbors. <laughs> now it's time to make some coffee. Now I am going to filter this. Now this is actually called a nut bag. It's like a cheesecloth bag that's meant to be used when you make your own nut milk or oat milk, which is why I bought it, but haven't actually got around to doing that yet. So this is the first time I'm using it. It has been sterilized. So I'm just going to put in, I don't know, a heaped dessert spoon. Is that enough? It actually smells really nice. Pour some water into it. Give it a stir. It's looking pretty weak. I'm wondering if I roasted the chickpeas long enough. Time will tell. Mine looks a lot paler than Paul's did. But if it is too weak, I guess we can just whack the powder back on a tray, stick it in the oven and give it another quick roast. This looks very weak. So I've just put in a dash of cold water. Let's taste this. I can't find the words to describe how this smells. Let's just say it doesn't smell like coffee. Give this a taste test. I don't hate it. It's strangely compelling, but first of all, it is very weak. I don't think I took it far enough with the chickpeas. I'll definitely give that powder another roast. Let's try it with some milk and sugar. Also check this out. It is a glass milk jug that I found online. It is 60 fluid ounces or 1.774 liters. So it is just a hair over the three imperial pints of milk that you are entitled to while you're living on the ration. Because I'm doing this for a whole year, it's just an easier way for me to keep track of my weekly milk rations. So once this is running low, I know I need to be careful. This is actually the last bit of milk from last week's ration. My rations reset today. So once this is gone, I get to refill it. You know what? I actually prefer it without milk and sugar. Not quite sold on this yet. I need to take those chickpeas a lot further. I just can't be bothered right now. I've done so much cooking today and I feel like I've eaten so much food. They're How growing in are. front of you. I'm going to go and relax with this thing. All right, so I've just spent one magnificent week eating my way through all of that glorious food. Now between the soup, the main and the dessert, there was definitely enough variety to keep me satiated throughout the week without getting bored. Now, as much as I loved that mock lemon meringue pie, my favorite thing of the week was actually the mince slices. They were incredible. I think it was because they were fried and they were crunchy and salty and oh, they just hit the spot. It was exactly what I felt like. Definitely give those a go. Now, just a few notes on that lemon meringue pie. Now I live alone, so I had to eat that entire thing on my own. And I did it with a smile on my face. It was so yummy, but I'm not gonna lie. By the time I got to the end of it, I was ready to move on. Delicious nonetheless though. Also, if you are going to make that, just be aware that the aquafaba meringues will dissolve the next day. They basically just turned into a kind of sugar glaze on top of the meringue. I personally didn't have a problem with that because they weren't made out of eggs, so I just left it. But if you did have an issue with it, you could easily scrape it off. But typically in the evenings when it was time to eat my slice of pie, 
I basically just inhaled it. So let's break down the cost of everything. I found this one particularly fascinating. So starting with the carrot and oatmeal soup, this only cost me $3.75. I got eight servings out of this, which means it cost me 46 cents per serving. Now for five nights during the week, I had smaller portions as a soup starter before my main meal. And then I had three larger portions for lunch on three days. Really, really enjoyed this soup. If you season it well, it's beautiful. And I must say it is one of the cheapest meals I have ever made. Now, once again, if you grew your own carrots, onions, and watercress, if you opted to use that as well, it would cost next to nothing. Moving on to the surprise potato balls. Now this cost a total of $3.70 to make and I made 11 balls. So that's approximately 33 cents per ball. Now I had two on my dinner plate each night, except for the fifth night when I had three. While I did enjoy them and would make them again, for me, I feel like that recipe needs a little bit more finessing. I'm not sure what I could add to it, but it'll be fun to experiment with it in the future. Moving on to the mince slices now. Now I estimated that these cost me approximately $4.88 to make. I got 10 slices out of it and I had two slices each night for dinner for five nights. So for those two slices over the five nights, that cost me 97 cents per night. Cannot recommend them enough. Go and make them. Now for the mock lemon meringue pie. Now this one was considerably more expensive because I used those raspberries. But if you cut those out, it becomes significantly cheaper. So including the raspberries, I worked out that it cost me approximately $9.65 to make. Now I got eight servings out of that and they were pretty decent servings. So that worked out to be a dollar twenty per serving. You could definitely cut smaller slices though to extend it. But if you didn't use the raspberries, that whole mock lemon meringue pie would have only cost $4.90 to make. And again, based on eight servings is only 61 cents per slice. Now I thought it might be interesting to see how the cost of my mock lemon meringue pie would fare against the cost of a traditional lemon meringue pie. So I looked up a very basic recipe, which included the ingredients for making your own pie crust and worked out that it would have cost approximately $12.30 in total to make. And based on eight servings, that's a dollar and 53 cents per serving. Would it be nicer than the one that I made? I'm not so sure. As I mentioned earlier, if you switched out the lemon essence for actual lemon juice, this is a solid winner. So if anyone would like to explore this and report back to me, I would greatly appreciate it. As for the broccoli and the cabbage, I bought two small heads of broccoli for $3.07. And I used about a quarter of a large red cabbage, which cost around $1.83. So the grand total for five three course dinners, plus another three lunches and an additional three servings of the mock lemon meringue pie only cost me $26.88. Now, even with today's insanely high grocery prices, I think that's a bargain. So if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching, especially during my slow descent into madness earlier on. <laughs> thank you once again for all of your love and support. I hope you're all having a blessed day and until next time, keep calm and if you can't make it, fake it.